Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. Brought to you by... When Science and Displays Direct was launched 15 years ago, it featured a complete line of banners and stands, product displays, and more. Today, the company is known as SDD and is the industry leader in turnkey, no-inventory POP programs. SDD has expanded into branding programs for both corporate and private label, as well as consulting services for retail showroom design and more. Visit sdd-us.com. That's sdd-us.com. All right, time once again for Music Night at the Majestic. With us tonight, Kevin Godley. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Tell you what, it's great to have you. You know, you are somebody who, you know, if we were to only talk about your music, we could fill an entire show. Mm. But you are, we covered, we got to talk about your music, your video, your film. Yeah, I mean, you name it. You know, not only that, but one of the things that really amazes me about you and your body of work, Kevin, is you, you've been in the business for what six decades at this point, covered six different decades. As a Pretty rule, much. yeah, as artists, you know, get further into their career, they tend to either get a little soft or you know, we'll say lose the edge. You, listening to Muscle Memory, your current album, you've never lost the edge. Well, that's good of you to say so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess that's, I guess that's because fundamentally, that's what I find attractive about doing the things that I do. If if I'm just doing things, if I'm doing things just for the sake of doing them, or I'm saying something that I've said before, or somebody else has said better than me, it's like, what's the, what's the point? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I guess it, what drives me is, is, it goes way back to when I was at art college and we had a, a an eccentric tutor at college who used to teach us in a very strange way. He, he was kind of a bit like the sort of fine art Brian Eno of his day. He would say, well, well, how do you work? How do, are you a charcoal on canvas guy? Are you a pencil guy or a paint guy? And you would say, okay, I like to draw on canvas with a pencil. And he would say, right, today, you're going to draw on a wall with a brush. In other words, he was fond of taking you out of your creative comfort zone and giving you something else to do. He would do crazy things like having people paint blindfolded or standing on one leg. And if you were right-handed, he would have you painting or drawing with your other hand. It, it, was, it was crazy, but the point was what you know you can do into an area where you don't really know what's going to happen. Not that something amazing always comes from that process, but at least it puts you in a frame of mind that allows that to happen if it's going to happen. And it's something I've always felt strongly about. It's, there's no point in doing something and all the work involved in getting from A to Z if you kind of know exactly what it's going to sound like, the thrill of doing stuff is is to create something new that you haven't heard before or seen before. Um, because the journey is as valuable as the finished thing, and the whole process has to be exciting. So that's that's a very long answer to a very simple question, <laughs> but but that's kind of it. That's what that's what gets me out of bed in the morning in terms of being creative it's like wow i'd love to do something that kind of does this and i wonder what will happen if you put these things together i don't want to know um, and i've never been that hugely interested in how the technology works or how a camera works it's always about 
having a vague sense of where you want to get to and finding a route to getting there uh, and unraveling the mysteries of it all on the route, on, way, on the way. Well, and sometimes you, it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, well, I, yeah, you say that and you know, I found in life you've got people who are, have very methodically planned out how they were going to live their life. They go to school, mm -hmm. they become an accountant or an engineer, they get the job you know, doing that profession, and they do it until they retire, and then you know, their career's done. Then you have people who just kind of let life take them where life is supposed to take them. And you strike me as one of those kinds of guys. I know I am, and I have a feeling you are too. Kind of, yeah. I, but I, I don't kind of wander around in a daze. <laughs> Thinking, oh, I didn't say that. I'm just saying you know, that way. Right. No, yeah. th but things come up it where does... you, know, you don't have an intention of becoming mm -hmm. a player in such and such a field, or you know, right. you know, uh, when you when you were you know uh, working with the guys pre 10 CC days, you know, uh, I doubt that you were planning on becoming one of the the prime forces of music video, you know, three decades later. No. I mean, that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. No, we didn't know a camel from a camera back then. But what we did know, and I think, that, I think this is key, that, that before we were musicians, we were art students. So A, being at art school in the 1960s was a hotbed, an incubator of so many things, of creative environments and ways of thinking. But B, having a visual background stood us instead when the time came to jump from one medium to another. And if you think about it, most of the things I've done uh, straddle both of those things. So, so... And it's, as you quite rightly said, it has been a series of coincidences, accidents, being in the wrong place at the right time or the right place at the wrong time or some place at some time where something happens. Uh, and uh, you don't always know where it's going to go, but if it sounds interesting, you follow it. Um, yeah, that's, that pretty much sums my life up, I guess. <laughs> well, t tell me yeah. this. I, I know you and Lowell met in art school. Yeah. How, did you, how did you wind up you know, working as studio musicians? Okay, well, all those years when we were, I was at art college for about eight years because I didn't want to grow up and I didn't want to get a proper job. And being at art school was, was a lot of fun. <laughs> and um, we were writing songs all through, all, the, all, all through that period of time. And the first thing we did on leaving college, on both graduating, was drive down to London to a recording session. Um, but becoming session musicians and becoming producers and becoming studio people only really came about properly uh, when Strawberry Studios came about, which was probably the first professional and high-end equipped recording studio in the north of England at the time. Um, this is probably around about the late 1960s, early 1970s. And we were, I don't know, we we'd start, we'd kind of made connections with people on, on, on route to this these years with, with uh, Graham Goulman and we met Eric Stewart and there was no real studio scene in Manchester or outside Manchester at all. It, everything to do with professional recording was down south. It was all in London. Uh, and we had this studio. I, I didn't have any financial involvement with it, neither did Lord Cream. It was, it was basically Eric Stewart and his partner Peter Tattersall who built it from scratch somehow with, they had a crystal ball that said this would be successful and they built a great studio and we, we used to go in when there was there was downtime when other people weren't using it and sort of mess around and 
Lol and I used to go in and we'd help test the equipment. I'd set up a kit and play while it was recorded. Lol would play. So we, we were kind of just kind of helping out in, in, in the early days. And then what tended to happen would people would come in, very strange collection of, of individuals and musicians. Uh, it was more like Broadway Danny Rose than a rock and roll scene. You would get comedians and ventriloquists and sort of dance bands and football teams. It's a real strange collection of people coming in to, to make music of one kind or another, whether you liked it or not. Um, we, we became kind of the house band and, and pr producers somehow, the, the four of us. And we kind of learnt our chops by, by doing that. Eventually it became proper music, but for a long time it wasn't. It was just these bizarre projects that were passing yeah. through. I think that kind of rubbed off on the early things that we did. It, we weren't just about making rock and roll. There was an element of, of humour in there. There was an element of this, of that. And, and I, it, it was part of our development process, I guess. Yeah. But we were quite good players as well. We, we, we could play our instruments and we played well together. But it took a while to get to that transitional point where we went from house band producers to a band. Right. Now, in, in between huge. that, uh, yeah. not to interrupt you, but to interrupt you, uh, right. the, the guy who you were working as his backing band, at that at that point, uh, and I mentioned this to a couple of people when we were talking about you being on this show, and I, I asked them if they could guess, you know, what well known songs that you know the four of you were were on, and when I told them that yeah, uh, the original versions of Solitaire and Lonely Night Angel Face was actually what became Ten CC as Neil Sadaka's backing band. They, they were stunned. Well, we weren't his backing band. We, we produced two albums for him at Strawberry Studios. So again, we were house band um, producers. We didn't tour with Neil. But he was the guy who said, you guys are great players. Why don't you form a band? And it was like a, a light bulb went off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, he was extraordinary extraordinary musician to work with he used to play piano and sing the harmony to his songs first which was which was most unusual mm -hmm. very bizarre but yeah that those were those were extraordinary days yeah now was he the one that said Okay, you guys, you know, really need to focus on your stuff, and that's what led to the formation of the band. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, as I just said, so you're you're great players. Why don't you form a band? And uh, I don't know. Maybe we're lazy. Maybe we just <laughs> hadn't thought of it yet. So we just thought, okay. Have we got any songs? Any of you guys got any songs? And we, we, we went in and recorded a song, I think it was one of Eric and Graham's songs, called Waterfall. It sounded a bit, a bit like Crosby, Stills and Nash, and we recorded it. And we tried to sell it to Apple, Apple being the Beatles company right. at the time. And it got turned down. They didn't want it. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't actually that great. But we, you know, during part of the process, we recorded a B-side for Waterfall, which was a song called Donna, which, I, you know, Lola and I wrote the song in half an hour. Sometimes, you know, sometimes the best ones come in half an hour. <laughs> and it was a sort of do what pastiche. And, and we recorded it probably in half a day or something. But that had, that had something. And... Uh, that was picked up by Jonathan King and was released on the UK label with Waterfall on the B-side, I think. We flipped it and it was a number two 
hit record. It was our first hit record. It was 10 CC. Mm-hmm. So kind of before you knew it, we were a band. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, tell you with it. Now, I, I could be way off on this, but looking at it from a songwriting perspective, and I'm not trying to draw comparisons, but just as, you know, something people can easily reference. Eric and Graham seemed like the McCartney to you and Lols Lennon when it came to songwriting. Is that fairly close? I wouldn't, I don't think it's a, it's a good comparison. Because your was, stuff seemed to have more of, more of, the, they saying, seemed very popish, if you will, or songs that were more pop oriented, whereas you had more of an edge, kind of, yeah, sat more satire yeah. to, to things than what they did. That's, that's, that's the analogy I'm trying to draw. I think, yes, to, to a degree, I think the truth is, is closer to they were skilled, accomplished, perhaps slightly more traditional songwriters, whereas we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We were sort of seasoned experimenters. Again, coming because we came from different backgrounds, they came from a strictly musical background. We came from an art school background. So we were we liked to tinker with the form, mm-hmm. whereas they, they liked to perfect the form, if you know what I mean. Right. And I think those two things meshing was, was the chemistry that worked. Exactly. You need to have the yin and the yang. Yeah, I think we were the young <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, the, the, uh, what I think works with those, you, you, uh, you mentioned like Donna, for example, the, uh, all those songs musically, they are, if you don't listen to the lyrics, they work as good, good records. When you listen to the lyrics, you can really enjoy the humor that's in there. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. I, I remember when we. Uh, it's interesting because the first album that we made, the first Ten CC album, I don't remember. I think it was off the bat of Donna, which was a hit, and we we had to back back in the day. You had to you know make albums quickly and get them out in order to to sort of make the most of of the moment. And we recorded the album very quickly. Uh, but I, I remember a distinct moment because, I don't know, when you're young and you're making records and you start, you are naturally kind of copying to a degree the people who you admire. And, you know, we, you know, we like the Beatles and the Beach Boy and Bob, Bob, Bob Dylan and, and this, that and the other. And whenever you sit down and compose, you something is drawing you towards that style of making music. But because we had so little time when we made the first album, there was no time to assess anything. It was like, write something, record it, move on to something else. In other words, we were totally being driven by by instinct, intuition and adrenaline, and not in any way, shape or form or at any time trying to compare it to anybody else's work. And it was only... I think it was after writing and recording a song called The Hospital Song, I think it was on the first album. That was like, what the fuck is this? No one's written anything like this. This is really bizarre. Don't even think about it. Move on to the next one. And it was in other words, it was a natural it was a natural progression that the the whole the speed at which we were working and the fact that we didn't have time to critique everything allowed us the freedom to do what came and to complete what came. And what came kind of defined a way of working for the next few years, which was, which was great. It was uh, That first album is something very special to me, some really interesting things on it. That I don't think would have come had we have had three months to do it instead of three weeks. Yeah. Now, of of the the, the four albums, which one is your favorite? 
sheet music. And why? Because it it was sophisticated enough without being contrived. It was it was simple enough without trying too hard to be simple. It, it got us a, a point in our development where we weren't self-conscious about who we were and what we were supposed to sound like. It was still, it was at the peak of our powers of discovery, if you like. Whereas the original soundtrack was a couple of steps further along from that. And it's difficult to analyse after so long, but listening to it now, it, it sounds like we knew a little bit more what we were doing. Whereas sheet music still had a little bit, it was a little bit more naive. It was it was a bit it was a bit more well, should we try that? Oh okay. Yeah. It was a bit cheekier, it was a bit more daring in, in, in some ways. Whereas original soundtrack is a little bit more polished and then how dare you was even more polished than that it was like i'm not a huge fan of polish yeah does that make sense sure <laughs> i'll tell you i'd be <laughs> remiss and i would you know get to get the viewers quite upset if i don't ask you about the making of i'm not in love okay we we recorded I'm Not In Love first. We recorded it twice. We recorded it. Uh, Eric and Graham had written this song, and we all thought it was quite good. So we weren't sure how to tackle the recording of it. So, so we, we recorded it very simply as a kind of cheesy bossa nova uh, kind of thing. And it, it did, I didn't really bring it to life. Um, so we shelved it. We didn't think there was anything there particularly, so we shelved it and carried on recording uh, the original soundtrack album. But a few people around the studio were singing it, the chorus, I'm like, oh, no, I don't know. And we knew there was something in it um, and that we'd have to come back to it and tackle it one more time, which we did eventually. And, like, sometimes what happened, what happens in a band situation like this is you, you put it on the table and you start talking about it, and out of desperation, um, you throw ideas around. And I, I thought, okay, what would it be like if we if we ditched all the traditional instrumentation and replaced it with uh, a tsunami of vocals, a mass a wash of vocals? Uh, and everyone went, yeah, how do we do that? And that was a whole other question again. So I think it was Lol who suggested tape loops. Um, but the first thing we did, we put it down on electric piano with me playing a synthesizer bass drum part and um, Graham playing rhythm guitar. It was the first thing that we recorded as a bed that we never intended to keep. And then both Lowell, myself and Graham went into the studio while Eric manned the console. And we recorded notes and we multi-tracked notes over and over and over again. Mixed them down onto quarter inch tape and made a very, very long tape loop of them. And and then fed that tape loop back onto a track of the 16 or 24 track tape recorder. And this took, this took a long, long time to do. And if you can imagine how boring it was to do. Um, but I remember there was, there was a certain point where we put all the notes down that we thought we would need and we fed it back through the console and we assigned certain notes to certain faders on the console. So effectively, the desk became a keyboard, if you like, but instead of going, uh, 
you were pushing failures up. And when we and when we got got to grips with that, it was like wow. We knew we had something special, and then we we started creating chords while the original electric piano, bass drum, and electric guitar were the bed, and essentially we were playing the desk to the original instrumentation, and it was like um, wow, and we kept the original. Um, rough vocal that Eric did when we were playing the first backing track, we kept that. He tried to better it many, many times, but couldn't. So um, it was it was a series of very of, of magical sessions. I can't describe it in any other way. There are many sessions you 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 work on, and there's you know if you're lucky, there's magical moments in them when you play something amazing. But it's very rare that you go into a session where every single thing that you try adds something amazing to the music we're working on. This was, this was one of those. It was like, it was a blessed series of sessions. And, you know, even adding silly things like somebody speaking in the middle uh, was great. And then adding musical boxes at the end was great. Uh, <sighs> It's 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 just one of those. It was it was kind of the moment where everything that we did and everything that we were kind of came together in that one moment. Uh, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary thing. Uh, yeah. Never Tell to me be this, Kevin. In that way. Who who did the big boys don't cry line, and how did that come about? It was. Um, her name was Kathy, and she was the secretary at the studio. And we had an idea. I can't remember where, where the idea of Big Boys Don't Cry came from. But we were thinking, who, who could, who could, we need, there was an originally a second middle eight in that part. And we thought, that's too ordinary. We need something different here. So we just ran out into reception and grabbed Kathy and got her in front of the microphone and said, say this when I tap your shoulder. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh, and it, again, mad as it sounds, it worked extremely well. Absolutely. I don't know what else to tell you. It, 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 was, it was, you know, it's, it's like we were talking earlier about all the accidents and coincidences in your life. It was that wrapped up in one session. <laughs> <laughs> in so, one six minute uh, piece of music yeah yeah so bizarre i mean uh, of, I can't, um, and the record company i think were probably a little bit scared because it was long we didn't want to cut it it was inc uncuttable um and back then you know singles were three and a half minutes and we right you know this was six so it was a tricky one but um but wow, we were yeah. so happy. I would think it's a masterpiece. Well, I wouldn't say that, but it's certainly better than the original version, that's for sure. <laughs> well, tell you what, I'll say that it's a recording masterpiece. How's that? Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, t tell you what, uh, you and Lol went out you know, uh, together as Godly and Cream. And there were two records of yours that it struck me when they first came out. An Englishman in New York okay. and mm -hmm. the, not just the music, but the video for that. Yeah. Now that you weren't directing videos yet at that point, correct? Or was that one of your first ones? It was a bit of both. We, we, we'd got in cream. We weren't a touring band uh, and an Englishman in New York was a good record. We thought it was a good record, but we didn't know how to promote it because we weren't a touring band. So we kind of figured it would be it would be interesting to make a little film to go with it. Um, so we went, we, we sort of, again, we didn't really know much about making film, but 
we had an instinct for it, I think. We drew up a, a, a little storyboard, an eight frame storyboard of the kind of thing that we had in mind. And we took it to the record label, I think it was Polydor, and said, listen, we've come up with this idea to make a, a little film to help promote uh, Englishman in New York. I don't know where you, you could show it, but it's something. Um, can we make it please? And they said, yes, but you've never done this before. So we need a professional director to direct it. And the guy we ended up being directed by was a chap called Derek Burbage. He did the first two or three videos for the police, their first releases. And what happened was we took to the process like ducks to water. It, it was suddenly, wow, here's something that we can do because it brings together the two things that we love. It brings together, it brings together music, it brings together pictures. And we have lots of ideas that I think that we thought we could, we could bring to life in this medium very precocious and, and and we kind of took over at a certain point it's it a bit embarrassing now but we <laughs> we we kept suggesting things and he would go yeah okay and, and, and <laughs> really okay um and we were we were terrible and, and we showed up at the edits and we were sort of twiddling knobs and saying well what happens if you do this instead of that and, <laughs> and Looking back at it, it is a bit of a it's a bit of a dog's dinner uh, of an edit, but, but it basically it showed us not only as artists but it showed us being thrilled by what this new medium could do, mm -hmm. and we, we, our instincts were were, were right. Uh, not everybody thought it was a good thing to do, and we kind of jumped into this into this thing. I remember distinctly, there was there was some big party uh, this period of time that took place, I think it was at the Houses of Parliament, for all the number one records of the last few years. And we got into a conversation with Freddie Mercury, and he was saying, well, what, what are you guys doing all this video crap for? You should be making records. But we knew he was wrong. We knew that, that, that that this is something that we needed to do. And indeed, what actually happened was it was the first time in our creative lives that we'd been at the beginning of something. You know, being in bands when we were kids and 10cc and all that, that's, that's fine, but it was hardly the beginning of anything. This was something totally new. It was filmmaking, yes, but it was it was being deployed for something new right and we just we we found ourselves being asked by other musicians to make videos for them probably to a certain degree because we were musicians ourselves and they felt they could relate to us more and well the rest is the rest you must know you know we, we did lots and we had a great <laughs> time doing it yeah there, there's a few um, of them of note <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> what was quite extraordinary, thank you. What was quite extraordinary about that is because at the beginning of the video industry, musicians per se and managers and labels didn't quite understand. And it took them a while to understand what, what video could do and why it could do it and what, what good video was or a bad video. So there was a, a good few exciting years where the lunatics ran the asylum and we were lucky enough to be two of them. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, Kevin, uh, I, again, the, the viewers, our, our viewers are very savvy. They are, the, our, our viewers are very passionate about music. And uh, when we told them we were going to be speaking with you, some of the videos that they were asking about uh, one of them right. that came up a lot was Duran Duran's Girls on Film. Yeah, I thought it might. What's, yeah. what's, what's the story on that <laughs> I wonder <one>? why. <laughs> Go figure. This, 
the story. Well, th those guys in the management were very savvy. They they figured out. They they they'd noticed or come to understand that that there were there were clubs springing up, probably in America more than anywhere else, where music videos were being played, uh, as well as music being played, uh, and the notion of music and pictures working together was something that was kind of catching on. So stuff was being played in clubs and stuff that was played in clubs um, didn't have to be censored um, because it wasn't being broadcast anywhere. So the brief was to come up with an idea that we could make two versions of. One was an extended version that could be played in the clubs and one was a version that could be cut, that could be broadcast on TV. Uh, and that's that was the sort of starting point for it. What happened then was, creatively speaking, Lol and I both went off on holiday. Lol went to, Lol and his wife went to the States, and, and my wife and I went to the south of France. And when we reconvened, we pulled some of the things we'd seen and done and came up with the two basic components that indicate what we were trying to do was mud wrestling, which I think came from Los Angeles, and a catwalk fashion show, which came from France. And those two elements were kind of the starting point for, for Girls on Film and, and gave us a, a template for all the other things that happened in it particularly the rude bits, the naughty <laughs> bits, which we wouldn't be allowed to do now, more's the pity. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the the video for Your Lol's Cry, that was another one that garnered yes. you know, quite a bit. How did you come to create that? Well, first off, that was Plan B. The, the original idea for we weren't that comfortable about being in our own videos particularly. Uh, so our original idea, there were, there were two ice skaters in England at that time called Torville and Dean, who were amazing ice skaters. Um, and we thought, wouldn't it be great if we got them to choreograph a routine to cry? So we approached them and they said, yes, we'd love to, but we're not free for the next six months. So in other words, they wanted to do it but our diaries didn't sync. It wouldn't work for the release of the album. So as a second idea, we thought, well, the song is the kind of song that, that anyone could sing. So why don't we pick a load of people from a casting book and get them all to sing it and film them singing it? Oh, that seemed like a sensible thing to do. Okay, we'll give it a shot. We had no idea that it would turn out the way it did. And But we kind of instinctively knew that when we filmed them, we should line everybody up as far as we possibly could so their eye line was all the same. Um, but the magic started to happen because of a very simple analog piece of editing equipment or an editing effect called a wipe. Um, where you can sort of slide one picture into another or open one picture out from the middle or go this way. Um, and it could either have a hard edge or a soft edge. And we were just messing around with the, with the desk, if you like. It's the same as a recording desk, but it's just effects to do with pictures. And we were messing around with this and we went from one face to another using a soft edge wipe. And it was like, whoa, do that again, but slower. And suddenly, there was somebody on the way from face A to face B that was face A and a half. It was like somebody, we've created somebody that doesn't exist here. And that was like, that was the magical moment. And we, and we carried on from that point all the way through the film doing that. You'll notice if you watch the film now, the first probably three or four face changes are whole faces. A whole face would mix through to another face and mix through to another and then mix through to another. But the one after that 
would, would kind of do this or it would do that. And we couldn't go back and do it again, A, because we were running out of time in the edit suite, and it would completely fuck up the quality of everything because we're working in analog video. And that's how it came about again, a series of intuitive accidents, I guess. And we decided to do it in black and white as well. And and it was it was like, I, I think the session, we probably finished about five o'clock in the morning because once we were dis discovered what we could do, we became enamored by the minutiae of how we could, how we could make it slightly better if we moved it at a different speed or if it went this way or that way or inwards or outwards. And it was, uh, it was extraordinary. We felt that once, I think probably more than anything else, even more than the songs, is, is that's what made it a hit record, wherever it was a hit. And I'd never seen anything like that before. And that's always no, it, a good it, thing. It's iconic. Yeah. So it now is. A, a, another video that you did that's also yeah you know, uh, one of the defining moments of that era was Herbie Hancock's Rocket. Yeah. How how did yeah. that one come about? We were asked to do a video for Herbie, uh, and we were also asked to do a video for Herbie that didn't feature him much because for whatever reason, MTV at the time weren't playing black artists. And we were going, well, why? Uh, they just weren't, they just weren't playing black artists. So they wanted a video that was, that just was begging to go into high rotation for whatever reason. And it's like, well, what does that mean? I mean, this was, Again, it was the early days of MTV, I think. And round about this time, probably about a month earlier, I'd seen a, a program on television, a local program that featured a five minute slot about this um, sculptor, this artist called Jim Whiting, who made these grotesque hydraulic driven robots. And I managed to record it on this excuse for a video tape recorder that I had, recorded this segment, uh, and th thought no more about it. I just kept it because it was interesting. And then this track landed on our desk, and, and it was like, that sounds like this looks. Is there a way that we can make the two work together? And there was, but there was a sort of, you have to understand that back then, one didn't have to go, thank God, through the process of presenting a treatment to anybody and then sitting around a table with a dozen marketing people and label representatives and executives. And it was, it was, much, more, um, it was much more about trust we like your work, we like the films you've made so far, would you do one for our artist? And you were kind of left alone to do that. You were given a certain amount of money. Very rarely was it a lot of money, but you were given a certain amount of money and then you were to deliver it at the end. That's what it was about. It was about trust. And this was one of those situations. We kind of gave them a vague synopsis of, of what we were hoping to achieve, but even we didn't know that we could. Um, and so we, we went to visit Jim at his strange house, which was full of bits of bodies hanging on the walls, not real bodies. Um, and <laughs> Thank he you made for clarifying. New... No, I'm glad, yes, it was very <laughs> bizarre. It was. I remember we banged on the door and we looked through a crack and we could see torsos lining the corridor. It was like, oh, what are we getting ourselves in for here? <laughs> and he lived amongst all his sculptural creations. It was, uh, it was astonishing. But he liked the track. He liked what we wanted to do. And so we concocted a plan. We built a set that was a facsimile of a 
of a house and we would populate the house with his creations um, and we would film Herbie separately on another day and pump him into a TV monitor that was installed in this house. That was essentially the idea. Uh, and we, we didn't film to music because with all these hydraulic pumps pumping and humping, we wouldn't have heard it anyway. We just spent the day filming details of all these strange creatures and objects um, whilst filming Herbie from the previous shoot on, on the TV monitor. And then we filmed the beginning shot and the end shot um, looking out the street near the studio. And then we went into an edit, not knowing how the hell we were going to fit all this stuff together. Um, and discovered that we could, that we wanted to scratch the film footage to match the scratching sounds on the record itself. Now you, you, you can't do that with film or you couldn't do that with video. So we had to, tr when you edit video or when we used to edit video back then, we shoot on film and we transfer all that material onto videotape. So in this case, we transferred it all twice, once going forwards and once going backwards. So all those little tiny cuts, we were cutting between backwards and forwards. We weren't doing this as you do with, mm -hmm. a, with a record. We were actually physically cutting. And it took, again, it was like, you know, it has to be a 24-hour session that burnt us, burnt us out completely. But again, at the end of it, looking at it, it was like, we love it, but they're going to kill us. <laughs> if, if you can imagine seeing that for the first time, right, back in whenever it was, They're this like was so, yeah, okay, so there was nothing like this no. out there on television, let alone MTV, MTV being quite extreme in some of the stuff, but there was nothing like this. So it was like... We kind of knew that it would either go down hugely well and get played to death, Other were, otherwise we, no one would play it and we'd end up in front of a firing squad. It was <laughs> going to be one of those. There was no, there was no middle ground. Thank goodness right. it was the first one. I think I think it picked <laughs> up a lot of, picked up a lot of awards at the first MTV uh, award show as well, but. I think Herbie, when Herbie first saw it, didn't know what the hell he was looking at. He's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and who can, who can blame him, you know? But it was like, again, we much, much as we knew when we'd uh, finished mixing I'm Not In Love, we knew that when we finished editing this, that it was something had happened. <laughs> we'd done something interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe a bit more than interesting here that, that may knock a few people sideways. Well, I remember um, at the time people were asking others, have you seen this yet? Because it was just so different that you couldn't help but stop and look. Yeah. Those are always the best ones. Absolutely. Now, the, uh, you did a bunch of videos for the police on the Synchronicity album. You also worked uh, a lot with U2 as mm -hmm. well. And I remember yeah. uh, seeing you, you were talking about what, when Sinatra did his duets album. I remember you telling a very yeah. funny story about trying mm. to record that. If, 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 you, if you would indulge us. Yeah, we, we um, Frank, we, a, it was it was quite convoluted how we actually got to work with him at all. What we had to do was was work through a friend of his, and who said the only way we could get Frank on onto something like this was invite him down to a local bar and set things up so Bonner would come in and. Um, 
I'd shake hands and we'd sit and talk a little bit. And he'd sit and talk and have a drink and we'd, we'd film what we could. We would never get a performance out of them. So um, I think the original idea was for Frank to arrive and bring a, a bottle of rare scotch to Bono, who was sat by the bar. So what we did was we hid a load of probably about eight or nine cameras, tiny cameras, they're called lipstick cameras, and we attached them to palm trees and pillars and champagne buckets and glasses. Uh, and they were, they were invisible. Um, so when Frank arrived, so the, but they were all, the cameras were all locked off. They weren't maneuverable. So what the camera saw was what the camera saw, and that was it. So what happened when the time came, Frank walked in and uh, presented the bottle to Bono and sat what was originally supposed to happen we we placed a bar stool where frank was going to sit in a very specific position so that we could frame him correctly on all the nine cameras he came in blah 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 moved the chair about a foot to one side and sat down and we didn't get him on any of the cameras at all we got like an elbow, you know, top of his head and a waiter passing through screen the pizza or something. So we had to cut all the cameras and he didn't know what we were doing. So I had to go and introduce myself to him and tell him what we were doing. And he got really pissed off. He said, what the hell is this? How's the record doing? How's the Jewets doing? And his friend, who had organized this, said he's doing really, really well. So I said, oh, well, fuck this shit. Um, these are a bunch of amateurs. I'm out of here. And he left. <laughs> um, which is his right to do. Because, you know, we haven't agreed. You know, it was, one, it was one of those crazy situations. He left. So we had like about 40 seconds if not less material in the can of Frank shaking hands with Bono. We got, we'd filmed the whole thing on a 16 millimeter camera as well, uh -huh. but that's all we had. So everything else from that point that's in the finished video is, was kind of made up on the spot over the next couple of days. Uh, we went out on a, on a car with a car, Bono driving an open top Mercedes with me and the cameraman sat on the shelf at the back filming him. And we ended up driving through some mad theme park full of life size dinosaurs or something. And I think Bono went on a car ride with Frank in the back of a limo. We got some footage from that. And then we found some wonderful archive footage of the original performance of the song which we could use. Um, but when it came to editing all this diverse stuff together, oh, we also shot a morning session at a studio, a TV studio, of somebody writing some of the lyrics on parts of their body. So we had all this material, but no real idea of how to put it together. And we started editing it together back in London. Uh, it was about a three-day edit or something, and we were like sort of two days in, and it was uh, looking okay, but it wasn't great. And then I had the idea of, of, of putting a whole bunch of material on one monitor and a different bunch of material on the other, and filming the whole thing using one of these tiny lipstick cameras, but also somehow doing it in slow motion. So I ended up sort of dancing my way through the edit, if you like, doing this, sort of swooping at the camera and, and doing mm -hmm. all this crap. And then editing those passes together to create the finished video. And thank God it, it, it worked, it worked. But the, the crazy thing was back in, back in those days, you couldn't do the edit and then we transfer it or Dropbox it to them. You know, it was, mm -hmm. it took days, you know, like satellites that wouldn't work. And we would come in each day waiting for a, 
a response. You know, Bono got back very, very quickly. I had a chat with him. He thought it was, it was great. So, <laughs> but the Sinatras took took forever getting back. Um, and uh, when they eventually did, they they it was a fax. <laughs> <laughs> we heard the fax sticking the fax fell off onto the floor and our producer picked it up gingerly and said so, and he said we love it so uh, yeah you, a, you, you don't want to get frank mad at you you didn't want to get frank mad at us what an extraordinary experience the whole thing was palm from palm springs what a place and so all the taxis at least back then all the taxis in palm springs were limousine signs. They were stretched cabs. <laughs> it was nuts, absolutely nuts. But I wouldn't have missed it for the world. So that's the story. I'm sorry it took so long to, to tell, but uh, <laughs> it's a good story. Now, yeah, it was a great show. It was a great and just just uh, extraordinary nuts. Yeah. Now, how did you come to do the uh, the real love and uh, when we was fab videos? Um, we'd known, we'd known Paul for, for a long, long time. He, he recorded an album, um, with his brother, Mike at, at Strawberry Studios. Um, when we were working though, he'd kind of come in in the evenings for a period of time when we were working during the day and we got to know each other and we'd play each other stuff. Um, and, and we kept in contact. He actually sang backing vocals on a track on uh, a Godly and Cream album. And so over the years, we, we kind of kept in touch. And our original video connection was, we were asked by Paul, I think, to do a, a sort of short form video for three Ringo Star Treks uh, that were kind of connected. And we did a film for Ringo called The Cooler. Um, which which turned out quite well, and then some point later on, we were asked to do when we was fab, which was like oh, wow. Um, so we came up with an idea for that, and we did it, and it was great fun, and we had a hoot, and it turned out really well. Uh, and then a good few years later, after Long and I split off, I was asked to do Real Love, which was what an honour, you know. I, the people who who sparked me to become a musician or any form of creative, but asked me to do something for them. I mean, that was, it doesn't get any better than that, you know? No, that it does and, not. And that, no, and so that, that was, again, it was a, an extraordinary, extraordinary experience, but, but amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you, the, uh, I know you were working on a film about Orson Welles. Uh, how has that well, progressed? Well, I haven't made the film yet. It, well, it, it's paused. <laughs> well, I there's was, a lot I of things in it paused lately. Was, oh, tell me about it. I was close. I wrote, a, I wrote the script. The script is called The Gate. And it's, it's based on something that not many people know, that his first professional appearance as an actor was in Dublin in 1931 at the Gate Theatre and he was 16 years old and he'd, he'd bullshitted his way into the Gate Theatre and impressed the people who ran it to such a degree that he was given a major role. Um, but the story surrounding it is, is interesting. It takes place at the beginning on the last night of his life when he was on the Merv Griffin show with his biographer, Barbara Leamy. And he remembers, as they were talking, the very first time that he performed live uh, because he went down extremely well on the Merv Griffin show and it reminded him of that. And that's how we get back to that period of time. But uh, I wrote the script, I wrote the screenplay, and we were, we were close to going into um, pre-production on the project when um, the coronavirus kicked in and the entertainment business went into free fall <laughs> including the gate 
Um, I'm hoping to 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 get that back on track very soon. Um, but that's that's kind of where it is. So the film is not made. It's still on paper. It's still up here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I that I want to do. Yeah. Now, fortunately, though, you were able to get muscle memory out before everything closed down. Yeah, although it had, it came out at the end of last year. We were already into it. We were already into uh, lockdown by then. And it feels like an album that was made in lockdown when, in fact, it was. I began to record it in 2017. So I was ahead of the curve mm -hmm. um, but yeah but it did I mean it was it was an album that was made for lockdown in the, that it was made a hundred percent remotely in that respect for the simple reason that, that the only instrument I could play are drums so I couldn't sit opposite anybody and write a song in the traditional way so the theory was ask, put an ask out via the internet, asking people to send me pieces of pieces of music with no tune and no lyrics, and I would contribute those two pieces to pieces of instrumental music. In other words, turn instrumentals into songs and perform them. Um, that was the theory, and it became practice. Uh, I got two hundred and eighty-six pieces of music. Uh, through over a period of time and I jumped in with both feet and somehow managed to choose 12, initially 11, but eventually 12 tracks that I could develop into something that I was pleased with, that, that became the Muscle Memory album. But there was a, a few serious speed bumps along the way, the main one being uh, I launched the project through a company called Pledge Music. And um, Pledge Music, it's, it's a, a crowdfunding site where people pledge a certain amount of money to get a T-shirt or a signed album or a question, a Q&A session with me or so on and so forth. Uh, the point being to raise enough money, to raise a budget so I could actually make the record properly. Um, but Pledge Music went bankrupt. And everybody who pledged and every artist that was on the site made no money whatsoever. Mm. So that was a major setback. But fortunately, I discovered um, this amazing uh, uh, label called the 51 States Conspiracy, who thought it was a great idea and took on the project and gave me enough money to, to finish it correctly. So, you know, all thanks to them for helping me to get it out. And uh, I, it was an extraordinary project to do. It's the first time I've done anything on my own, although it's not strictly on my own, but as, <laughs> as, as my own as an artist fr fronting, fronting anything, it, it, was, uh, it was quite a challenge. And there's, yeah. there's, always that, there's always that friction, you know, that sort of sense that when you go into something like this, oh, yeah, I can do this. No problem. No problem. I know I can do this. There is no way you are ever going to do anything like this. Just forget about it. It's going to be a fucking disaster. But it's the friction between those two things that, that mm -hmm. somehow create uh, uh, an environment of, of confidence and panic that somehow gets you through. And, and uh, it worked in the end. It worked. I think. Well, I, it, when, I, when I said at the beginning about how you you had not lost the edge, when you listen to that album, yeah, you know, it, it's clear that a you've still got things to say, and uh, you you never in your entire career have ever played it safe. Well, as I said, it's, what's the point? <laughs> There's no point in playing it. There's no point playing. Well, there is a point in playing it safe, and you don't have to worry about it. But it's 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 kind of like what what excites me. I want to do something that I would like to listen to, and I certainly wouldn't like to hear Kevin Godley playing it safe. 
<laughs> it's kind of not it's not it's not the point it's not yeah. my point anyway and oh. i think lyrically lyrically it was i didn't set out to be political or anything it was just what was going on at the time i was making the record the world mm -hmm. was like sort of turning upside down in many respects and there were so many bizarre and shocking things kicking off. I, I couldn't help but write about it. I mean, it, a lot of frightening things and horrible things, but those kind of things are great for lyricists, unfortunately. Oh, right. Well, to tell you what, Kevin, there's a great quote from you. I'm going to use this to, to wrap things up because uh, what the folks don't realize is, well, you know, we're just outside of Chicago. You're actually in Ireland. So it's getting quite late where, <laughs> where you yeah. are. So, but you have a quote where it said, for a, for a guy who can't play guitar or keyboards, I haven't done too badly. <laughs> that's, that's not a bad quote. <laughs> <laughs> you should take credit for that. That's not bad. Yeah, that's not a bad quote. It's probably the best thing I've ever written. That <laughs> quote. <laughs> well, tell you what, Kevin. I on, uh, on that note, we'll wrap this thing uh, up here. Uh, for everybody who's been watching throughout the show, we've had uh, your website, kevin-godly.com, as well as where they can follow you on Twitter, at kevingodly9, and then on Instagram, at kevingodly. So uh, yeah, we will... Can I throw... Can I throw one more thing in before? Oh, we absolutely! Whatever you want. I have a new. It's it's a bolt-on project, should we call it? Um, sure. To the to the muscle memory album, it's uh, a series of spoken word pieces. Uh, that's the intention. The first one is coming out on the twenty fifth of March, and will be on Spotify, on Amazon, Deezer. Apple, etc. Uh, and it's for a series called Conversations with Myself. And the idea is uh, I'm taking two extreme points of view about the subject matter of some of the songs on the album. I'm talking about it with myself. And the first pilot episode, they're all companion pieces to the track. So the first one is called Linguistic Errors of Judgment and is based on the song Cut to the Cat and lasts about okay. 16 minutes. So you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. <laughs> it like Herbie Hancock, if you like. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, I just had to get that in because that's, that's, that's coming up very shortly and uh, I've never done anything like that before. Well, so, I'll tell you what, we'll make sure to link to that, uh, Kevin, when, we, when this posts. Oh, please do. Thank you. No problem. Well, tell you what, well, thank you for taking so much time out of your uh, day to, to join us here on Music Night. We do appreciate it. A pleasure. It was a conversation. It was not an interview, which was refreshing. Oh, well, well, thank you very much. Well, on uh, that nice note, we're going to wrap this one up. So, everybody, thank you for watching this edition of Music Night to the Majestic with Kevin Godley. Kevin, thank you for joining us. Everybody, have a good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media, is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time. For Music Night at the Majestic, this is your announcer speaking.